Hey, what's up guys, it's your boy Days, and you're about to watch Thorin rant for about three hours. Right, this is gonna be another episode of Talk to Thorin, my little interview series. And this one is actually one where I had an unusual genesis. Basically, I did a video on my channel in the Thorin's Thoughts series, which was called the Deny the Plant Meta. And essentially, Davey saw it and had some thoughts about it. And I thought, well, we'll just do a little episode where basically we expand on that further. He gives his take on things. We see what we're going with. So the basic premise of the of the video, I mean, it's it's I made it pretty self-explanatory. It's that to me, the meta game right now, specifically with how CTs get punished by the fact that terrorists can't really fuck up on the pistol round. They sort of always get to the money they need to get two rounds into the game. Coupled with the fact that as CT, you need so much economy in the modern day. Already, I'd noticed, I made a video previously about this, that people already seem to misunderstand that even though the scoring system of CS tells you, it's just about winning the round, bro, you get 16 rounds. It's like the amount of rounds that you win as a CT with only one or two people alive actually is going to massively impact how your chances of winning that game is. Like, people can understand if you have one or two people who don't have full utility or don't even have a gun... A CT side, it's going to be a lot harder to play in the modern day than it used to be back in the day. So actually, I already think the game isn't just about winning a CT. A CT, it's about winning and having enough people alive to keep your economy going. People sort of get that angle. But where they hadn't carried it further is, to me, I looked at, at the fact that you need to keep people alive in that sense. And it actually sort of inverts what people's theory of Counter-Strike is. Because one of the key concepts in Counter-Strike for the last, I'd say, like 15 years has been the concept of a trade frag. And so one of the reasons why famously you often play off a bomb site and let people go for the retake approach is you're just trying to do basically the CT equivalent of a trade frag. And it's like, right, when we go back in, we want to go with a pack of people. If you die here, I'm going to trade correctly off you. And eventually, you know, we go down to a 1v1. Whoever wins, that wins around. But like I say, that's more in line with the thinking of just whoever wins the round so my theory it doesn't apply in all cases obviously this is like a general way of thinking but where i was coming at this from is i actually think an area in esports and cs particularly is mad underdeveloped is things like basic floor chart of like how do you optimally want to play out situations at the moment pros don't even discuss that you know we we do we dissect one specific instance in a game if we saw someone fuck up but there's very rarely actually like principles or rules or whatever so where were you coming up for this from when you saw my video mate yeah, so like when I saw it, I liked like when you made the uh, the the reference to basketball. I don't watch basketball, just off the bat, I don't. But I know like the general rules and you know three pointers, two pointers, and whatever. And the same rules apply in basketball. They apply in football or soccer. They apply in hockey or ice hockey, depending on where you're from. They apply in Counter Strike. Is that you always want to play the odds? Always, you always play the odds when you're playing a game of Counter Strike because. The, what you know what happens is if there's there's situations where like you like like you were talking about in your video where most of the time if you do x you will win the round if mo if you always follow that mo you know just the law of uh, you'll you'll win sure. most of the time so but what so where so even though that's a good general macro concept is play the odds right general good macro concept it's good but i think that that actually changes depending on so many factors in Counter-Strike. there's it, it, it changes depending on the map. It, de it changes depending on how much utility you have. It changes depending on what players you have. I think uh, a couple of years ago, I, I saw a video where you made where you were you were talking about how uh, even though one peak for a specific player is the right peak because of their play style, that same peak wouldn't be the correct peak for a different player yeah, because their exactly. chances of winning that fight are different. Yes. So depending on the type of players you have, it's actually... It, uh, it w might make more sense to play the retake style or it might make more sense to play to fight. I remember back in the day, this would have been a couple of years ago, playing um, uh, on Dust2. There might have been other teams that did this, you know, not just these teams, but playing against Furia and playing against uh, other Brazilian teams like uh, IMT back in the day, they wouldn't let you plant. And this was like way back, like this is like, this is years ago, when as soon as you took a bomb site, their strategy was just throw bodies at you endlessly like don't give them any space don't give them any time and that and, and so what they would do is like let's say let's say you take b on dust 2 and you 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 kill the b guy instead of immediately going for a save flashes raining over guys running in jumping through window they'd go by themselves they didn't even care they were just right. just get in just get in cause as much chaos as possible and that was like a, that was 
very different. Whereas before you would see teams who would have their set retakes or you'd have teams that would just call the save and when they're in those disadvantaged situations. But for them, what worked because of the types of players they were and their styles, they would just fucking send it. Like they would just come flying at you from all angles. There'd be nades going everywhere. It, they would just cause pure chaos. And so they would win those rounds sometimes. Like e even when you have like an 80%, like if you're up five versus four and you have the B bomb site on dust two as a T, that's like a 90% chance you win that round. Yes. But they would just throw bodies at you and make the odds more in their favor. And just, just to try to get those rounds. And it was like crazy to play against. So yeah, as far as the whole macro concept goes, there's plenty of situations where you... Even if you're on equal numbers, and this is sort of where I, where I disagreed when you were talking about how in CSGO, the economy actually makes it where um, if you're equal numbers on, on a retake, you, chances are you're going to lose more guys. So it's not, it's, like, it's not worth it. You might as well try to stop them before that. And I think that with CSGO, it really depends on the map. But because of the use of Molotovs and how many nades you have, there's plenty, like, like uh, B on Inferno, you can actually play full retake on the B site where you, n none of your B players die and you just like keep control of backhauls and you can do a full retake on the B site with your nades and barely lose any people because of, there's only a cert, so many positions they can actually play on, on, on the post can, plant. Yeah, exactly. They can't hide, basically. Like, yeah. In certain corners that you Molotov exactly. where you flash out. Yeah, that makes sense. So as long Basically. as you have utility... It's yeah. at, uh, playing retake is actually really viable in, on a lot of situations. Well, actually, there's an area already we can expand the premise. Because obviously, I was mm -hmm. trying... I mean, the whole point of what I was saying, as you noticed at the end of the video, is this is more like a note along how people coach pro players. Like, what I want in the future is like those examples I gave from sports, where the idea is mm -hmm. you can't wait till you're in that situation to figure it out, because you might have had to actually do something like slightly before then in terms of your overall approach, like knowing what is... As, like you say, knowing how to play the odds. Like, what are the best chances in this? scenario basically if you, i'm talking like a general picture but if we start to modify it like this and put in like what what would be variables that would change whether you would do this or not there's t two that immediately i think of one is it's it's similar concept to why you can't say the best counter strike is tactical counter strike or the best counter strike is ones where the star players make the players like depends what your team is obviously so in mm. the same sense as i don't think actually that the best style of Counter-Strike, by the way, for most teams is actually like Astralis style Counter-Strike. I don't think most of them could pull it off. So I would say it's the best if you're Astralis, obviously, like they're the masters of it. So similarly, actually, if it's a team like Astralis, maybe I don't mind them doing full retakes. I'm sure their retakes are the equivalent of an execute, you know, like they're going to have such an amazing covering each other's backs. Like they probably could do a mad 3v3 retake on Dust 2 and not lose anyone doing it. Whereas the problem is, if I'm thinking of one of the more individual teams, they're definitely going to lose two guys even with take that retake. Like, they're not going to coordinate. And as you say, there's the other factor that you should probably heavily factor in in this case is what was your utility situation? Yeah. Like, that will change completely how you play the defensive side anyway. So in terms of whether you can do a retake, put it this way, if you're in a retake with no utility, some of these bomb sites are almost impossible to not lose people if you go into. And that's the part where, that's where I knew I was going to lose people. Like, not you, but I mean, like, people who are either, like, low-level fans who just think, what am I doing in matchmaking? Or people who've watched pro play and do that classic thing where they think, well, I'm sure every pro would know better. That, you know, because they, they don't realize the pro doesn't stop and think about that. Because what I'm trying to make the case of in this situation is if we're in a scenario like the sites we're talking about and you don't have much utility early in the round, you just have like a gun and light utility. Actually, logically, you might want to fight these situations and not give up the site. Like you might, you're just going to reduce your chances a lot more. And in my opinion... The reason the pro player never stops in questions, like, should I have done something 10 seconds earlier? It's because he's just thinking where in the moment he's in now. So then he's just thinking, right, well, I'm just going to save now. So to him, that round was always a save. But what I'm sort of saying is, actually, maybe if you'd identified, like, halfway into the round, let's say we used half our utility, right, actually, if they come to this site, we might as well just stand our ground. Your chances might go up, like, 10% of the win round. Yeah, no, it's 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 actually true. And we used to have comms on teams where we would just say, um, like we're 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 just going to the death right here. Like where there's like thirty seconds left, we have no util, and it's like, all right, guys, just to the fucking death right now. Like just go ahead, frag out because there's no way we're holding this shit. And uh, if if everyone's gonna rotate, like like you know what I mean? Like if you're like if you're on playing A on Inferno and you have two guys that are in B. And you are, and you're down four versus five, and you have two people in A right now. You you just you just tell the B guys, all right, just fucking save, and we're just gonna go to the death here, like because there's no because there's no way you're gonna retake that unless you have a bunch of util. And I think that's one thing that like you were talking about, it's it's really important that 
for, for teams that are even going to try to play with these concepts, your communication has to be on point of course, because yes. players need to be communicating what nades they have, like as they're going in. Because if because player, players, you'd be, you'd be sh actually, I guess you wouldn't be shocked. Other people would be shocked how much that doesn't get communicated, where oh, people course, won't yeah. say what nades they have, and 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 then all of a sudden you're you're walked up, you're all set up for this retake. It's like, all right, now uh, somebody flash, no. No flash? All right, fuck it. Let's just go in. Because you, you've already committed to it at that point, and nobody has a flash. And th that shit happens all the time at the high level. So when it, when it comes to these, uh, like it, it's almost it's like the overarching thing is a macro concept, but it becomes a bunch of little micro things like th throughout each individual round because every round, the, the, the scenarios are so different. The odds change so quickly and so frequently depending on like the tiniest little things that I just think... For for teams, the most important thing always will be the comms. It'll that'll be the most important thing, especially for like you were talking about teams that haven't gone over all this shit beforehand for some reason. Like teams who haven't figured out how they want to play out situations. Teams who haven't figured out like I think I think that's one thing that's really underrated about Kerrigan is you can always tell that his teams have very distinct styles and like and the players are in the positions to fit that style. And it's not the same style every time. Like it sure. changes depending on the players that they have. And so I think that's one reason why um, the Kerrigan teams always perform really well, even even if they're not the favorites. Because I think this even ties in. Like, put it this way, I'm not even, like, calling coaches out with some of this. I actually think genuinely it's an area where they haven't actually had a chance to sort of look at, like, principles of the game. Because one of the reasons I understand why coaches wouldn't coach or think this way is typically, I know it's not the case for this year, but typically if you're a, a tier one CSGO coach, you're usually at the LAN already. And basically you're just thinking like, right, I've got four hours, six hours, 12 hours till this next game. So all I'm really doing at this point in time is basic film work for the next match, probably of like two specific games. And so in that case, you're using such a small sample size, you are going to end up coaching situations that you're just going to basically say like, right, when, when he's specifically in position X and you're in mm -hmm. position Y and it's this time, Here's what you're gonna do. So the problem is, if you do that, you'll never even you'll never even start to approach these types of topics because these are more, like I say, like macro level concepts. It's like basically, it's like saying it's like saying what style do we want to play and like what speed do we want to play the game. At? Like these are things you'd think about more generally, but people actually take a lot of it for granted. Like they just take for granted that their players move this fast or that we do a fast retake or we do a slow one or whatever whatever the angle is. Like they, I think, in my opinion, they don't sort of like put enough collective time into that approach. Because one of the things I'm essentially trying to address is, like you're saying, you, everyone would have to understand this principle for it to work. Like, there can't be one mm. guy making this call in his head and then another guy trying to wait up the same thing. You'd have to be on the same page. So, like, what I'm trying to get people to do is coach, like, tendencies, essentially, or what our general approach is. And then from that, yeah, obviously there'll be exceptions to the rule or you'll hope the person's smart enough to calculate when we're going to do this and when we aren't. Because I think a lot of fans, is what it's one of the things that's so misunderstood, is they really don't get it. They really, th it's, it's weird because in traditional sports, right, people get it, that there's a big difference between your athletic ability and like how smart you are about the game. It's one of the reasons why if you notice in most pro sports, I mean, even hockey it goes with, your actual like prime as a player is usually after your physical prime. Because, you know, if anything, your physical prime lets you get away with shit that you can't later when you become a normal human again. Like, the, like you know, you're not the fastest anymore. At that point in time, hopefully, you've been spending so much time working on your mind side of the game that you just win by just knowing better than the other guy what to do in every scenario. And so you see, like, amazing defensemen in hockey who are, like, 36 years old. Like, there's no way that guy's beating you to the spot. He just has to understand how you're going to skate, how he's going to skate, what, what formation he's using with his other defense. Like, it's a million factors that have nothing to do with you know, basic interaction. So what I'm kind of getting to is there's a lot of fans who mistake in Counter-Strike, aim is essentially like the equivalent of the athletic ability. Yeah. They mistake the fact that this guy's an amazing aimer and think he knows everything we're talking about here. Even though, by the way, these are things that took me like 10, 15 years to think about. Like I wasn't just thinking about them at the first game. So I'll give you an example. Another thing I brought up and I did it in a throwaway manner because people who know the game are going to know this. Is And it's something that pros don't even think about. I, I, I'll give people an example. The amount of times I see top pro players in teams who are going for a retake and the way they time the retake is basically the worst approach. It's like they don't go in fast when the other team's not set up. Mm -hmm. 
they go in as slow as possible when the team's 100%. Basically, in a lot of sports, it would be the equivalent of like showing your whole hand as to what you wanted to do. Like on like the line of scrimmage, just telling the other team, like, yeah, I'm just going to come in. Really. You know, like you'd give the whole game away. Like that principle I say there, which is another basic principle that every pro should know, which is if we are even numbers and the terrorists start planting, we have a numbers advantage while they're planting. Yeah. The amount of pros that don't exploit that window is actually fucking bonkers, mate. Like, again, if you're the Australia Super Duper team, we're going to lurk all over the map and maybe it's better for you to like make the other team make the first yeah I get it for that but like the number of times that teams that themselves play very messy counts like don't use a principle like that is nuts to me like I'll give you the most obvious one you know the classic one that everyone who's ever watched a game like as a commentator and analyst knows is where there's two CTs left and they don't know which bomb site they're going to. So what they do is they mm. always split up and then they wait, right, I'll just call you to the other side. Right, What? that's an ex- a perfect example of where top pros are missing the premise I'm saying. Because in that scenario, if they come to the site and you, obviously you're going to pull out, right, because you're waiting for your other teammate. If you know that one of them started planting, you can actually attack now, mate. You're now in a 1v1. You can actually basically like win the round in a much higher chance. And if you wait till it's fully planted, they hide and then it's a normal 2v2. Like, obviously, again, we deploy all these variables. What yeah. utility have you got? What health have you got? We've got, yeah, there's a million facts. But that's an example of where, like, and maybe, maybe you can speak to this. This is the sort of shit that maybe coaches, IGLs, some very experienced players would know. But it's not you, you don't have these discussions typically, right? They're kind of like out in the weeds for a lot of pro players to have this kind of talk. Definitely around that scenario specifically. Yeah. Like that I've never even I've never even heard that scenario discussed ever in any of my teams. Cause like like you were talking about before with the coaches, a lot of the times when you're at an event or when you're rewatching a game they point out players individual mistakes like they'll point out they're like this little micro decision that they made it's like that decision was bad you you should have made this one and it's like and sometimes sometimes the player actually doesn't know and it causes like an argument and then eventually everyone has to be like no no you did fuck that up there and that does happen but like most of the time it feels like all the mistakes like they're, they're just pointing out mistakes for the sake of pointing out mistakes and so and then and sometimes the they kind of like earn their keep right to be like look i spotted something guys that you know yeah it's a way to justify that you need a coach in a sense right? kind of yeah kind of it's like it's like it's yeah. like they're looking for a reason to be there so they're so they're like oh you messed that up it's like i know i fucking messed that up like of course i like i know that i you know what i mean like 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 stupid things like oh man you you uh, should have been closer to him so that uh you could have traded that kill it's like yep thanks man like great great country and that that happens frequently oh, yeah. and so it's almost like they're looking for a reason to be there and i remember i don't i think and this is this is going to be um a little strange for people but way back when um on splice way back we had grt as our coach and um i'm, I'm sure you know him from yeah. uh, back in the day and he was actually he was terrible at the little micro things of like uh, that that was wrong that was wrong here but what he actually did do really well was make sure that everybody on the team was playing the same style so we all had like a we all knew exactly what each other's style was. Quality, had, right? It actually is a really un, even yeah. at the time I didn't realize it. Like I, I I realize it looking back, but at the time I didn't like know really what was going on. I was just kind of a brain dead idiot. And it was like and Arya and, and him were like that was actually a huge thing that because we were terrible. So that was like a huge thing that contributed to us being competitive because most teams didn't have that. And so I think that that's a really underrated thing that 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 coaches don't do. At least in my experience, coaches didn't really do that. Or if they did, it it was failing or something. <laughs> I don't I don't know. But yeah, I think that um, the, having those scenarios. I think I remember from an interview back in the day where MIBR before they were MIBR when they maybe when they were SK or LG, they talked about how they would just have like hours of theory sessions where yes. they would just talk about situ- and that was when they were at their best, right? Yeah, so yeah. I think and um, so I think that there's sort of a common thing, even the Fnatic team from way back when that very loose, aggressive sort of mid round play style that they played, they were all incredibly comfortable in that style. It yes. made sense for everybody on that team. So they actually built the team according to the style that all the players want to play. And I think that's something that gets really underrated when building teams as well, is making sure all of the players fit into the same style, even if one player is not necessarily um, better than, than, than another one. No, I think those are two good examples as well because like the the SK team, I remember specifically, it was actually when they were going for that second major that they won, which mm-hmm. they won. Okay. Like, like they were super dominant at the time. Like they were easily the best team. They they said basically something like that. 
like that they were already practicing for like a few hours of actual scrims and the rest was just hours and hours of theory. And the thing is yep. that like, listen, there's a lot of people might make up a cool story. Like when people just lie as pros, like, oh, I've practiced 14 hours a day. It's like, no, you mean on like a big day, but you know, like that doesn't sound like a lie though, because if you looked at that team's style, that was the team that was infamous for like, if they got you into like a 2v2, they just never fucking lost because the, the logic was everyone understood the same philosophy on how to play the game, which presumably came from these these sessions and then similarly with Fnatic the joke is part of the reason why Fnatic themselves didn't know why they fell off and when then when they went to other teams didn't know why they couldn't be the best again is do they really thought calling defaults was like the ultimate way to play Counter Strike they didn't realize like well it is if you have like the ultimate players like if you just have like the most genius lurker or you have the most god tail entry player like you're like yeah if you have all these pit guys who are sort of are self sufficient yeah you do just do a default at that point what you basically said is I trust you to take over the rest of this way of playing so like these teams if anything took for granted that like that works with the right personnel with the wrong personnel it's gonna be a nightmare obviously like you bring in a guy who's an idiot he's not gonna have any clue what you do in that sense because one of the reasons i was actually thinking of this topic ties into that it's like similar to the sk way of thinking which is i remember reading a book it was a biography of a guy who's it's quite a famous one actually it's called the art of learning where it's a guy mm -hmm. who was like a chess player right and one of the things he talks about is Everyone in the chess world, it's funny, anyone who's played online games with a ranked system is going to know this mentality. They're all like the equivalent of the guys in League of Legends or StarCraft who are always trying to do like cheese. They're always looking for like the champion or the build you can do that just gets you a, a sort of a cheap win, you know. You didn't have to actually be better, but you win. And remember, everyone who's playing the ranked mode, they're just addicted to seeing the rating go up, aren't they? So they're, they're not really there. Like, like my philosophy is like a boomer philosophy. It's like, right, what you try to do is you try and get your understanding of the game to such a high level and execute at such a high level that eventually it'll take care of itself and you'll be one of the best if, if you have the capability to be the best. But that's the opposite of what most people do because that's like delayed gratification. That's like, right, it's going to suck in the beginning because I'm going to be shit. I'm going to have to learn all these core principles which probably aren't even going to win me any games early. But eventually I'm hoping that all compounds into being like the ultimate understanding of the game. So basically, essentially, this guy said in the chess world, even though you'd think again, chess is like a fucking old school game. It's like super nerd. No, dude, loads of people in that game apparently were addicted to just like studying the newest openings and all they kept thinking was that they were going to find think about how many noobs in cs it's like the equivalent of asking for the config you know like they all think they're going to find that secret that'll just make them tomorrow twice as good and so they were all looking for these like nerd openings that like no one else has that might get you like that one extra piece up in the game and obviously in their brain we found one piece up now we're going to win more games and what they didn't get was apparently a classic way of training you in chess was the opposite is that you start at the end game where you've got like three pieces left yep. and then you figure out like right well since there's only so many moves I can make what are the principles that govern making these moves like if he has one move one piece more than me and he's the, and it's these specific pieces how how many ways can I still win a game like how do I maneuver him and the idea was if you went that way and built it up like you were comfortable in all scenarios in the game and especially at the winning moment you understood the core principles of the game because I feel like that's an area again like we're talking about here Everyone's way too obsessed in CS with what you call the particular and not the general. Like they haven't thought, mm -hmm. what is my vision of counter Like, How do I prioritize the game? It's one of those areas where I don't know if you saw this, but I even saw there was an interview with some of the Team Liquid players when they were talking about that last year where they had that amazing run. And they even fully admit it that the year before when they always used to come second to Astralis, they would even fall into the trap of thinking, right, Astralis does everything the best, so we should try and do what they do. Which yeah. is like, yeah, but dude, they've got such a different team to you. Like, <laughs> your team, like, the funny thing is, they obviously figured out in the end, less is more. Like, with our team, we should just be fucking going in with deagles and shooting them in the head. That, that is our approach to Counter-Strike. It isn't the Astralis angle. So, to me, these, these areas are actually, as interesting as they are, they're mad undiscovered. And people really haven't put a lot of time into them. No, it's it's true. People haven't, and it and and it is it is a strange thing. I think it I, it might even be like a like, I think I think what it, it almost always what it comes down to, at least in Counter Strike, in my experience, is is it's a fucking ego thing a lot of the time, where um player where either players will um will think like no no what like what I know is best always right. Everyone always thinks what they know is best most of the time, and so you actually have to have that coach who has like the strong will and that general macro concept to be like, no, trust me. Like we, we need, this is something that's really important. And like we we're talking about before, you need that GM or that coach or whoever's involved with it to actually build the team around a specific style of play. Because if you have players, no matter how good they are, if you have 
uh, two players that really like playing one way and three players who like really playing a different way, that team will almost never be able to gel properly to actually win anything. Yes. You, you really need everybody to, and, and what's really underrated about that fanatic sort of defaulty style or that team liquid sort of style is players like, players like NAF, players like Crims, where you don't actually need to be communicating with them for them to know what to do. Yes. That's so underrated in a team. There's so many teams where people play on and people aren't paying attention to shit. People, people react poorly and, or the, the people miss comms and they're like, oh, I didn't hear you say that. Where I've played with players in the past, like actually Cutler is one of the players who was really good at this. It's probably one of the reasons why he stayed on teams for so fucking long. It's because he doesn't have to say anything and he doesn't need you to say anything to him. Obviously, sometimes there's comms that are necessary, but generally, I bet he calms 50% of what most other players on the team calm. And he, still play, and he just plays off of people so well. And obviously now he's in Valorant, but there's lots of players like that in Counter Strike, like like Naf, like um, uh, who else is really good at it that I'm trying to think of from from maybe like a, a lower tier team. I think I think obviously Kerrigan's really good at that. He sort of fills himself into whatever role. But like just those players where you don't need really need to communicate. Obviously Crims, like I said before, where they just sort of play off of everybody around them, and then that makes that that cleans up the comms too, because people aren't calming too much. They're not over calming, and then it, and it makes it so that you you feel comfortable playing with them. And you're and if you and if so then if you feel comfortable playing with a player specifically, and then everyone on the team has like that overarching concept that everybody is now applying to the game then then th that extra bit of chemistry makes the difference between being a great team or being a good team. I mean, like a classic example to me, because basically what we're also talking about here, which I totally agree with, by the way, it's one of the reasons I'm so interested in this, like Henry G and Cassard approach to Cloud9, because mm -hmm. they sound like they've got this principle down, that they understand that it's not even about getting the best five players. It's about getting players that will fit to the specific vision of the game. Like this person yeah. balances out like the aggression factor of this guy. This guy balances out how the other guy's too loud or this guy's too quiet. You, you know, you want to balance all these elements out because... Again, these are areas that are like sports GM concepts that just don't exist in esports games. Because I, I mean, I hate to give a spoiler to fans, but it's like Lopez actually nailed this sort of in a really brief way when everyone was doing the force buy meta, right? Obviously, the real people would always justify force buying all the time was like, well, those French teams used to win a million games off it, which was true, right? But obviously, mm. the reason that came back to bite them is eventually they were the worst examples of force buying and then just losing the game off it and like, you know, get like three less gun rounds. So Lopez used to say back then even if it's true right now that these specific force spies generally like work out more in your favor don't worry the players will do it even when it no longer makes sense and the number one reason why is because it will always be more fun to think you've got the little lottery ticket cz than to save and go for this not very sexy like full done round that you then have a lot of pressure to buy on like like in that scenario the the player because at the end of the day they are still young kids playing a game they're going to just basically pick what gives them a little dopamine hit, not like the most effective strategy. Like I think that's an area that a lot of fans don't understand. We haven't maximized this game at all. Like there's a lot of areas no. that we're kind of doing like just shit off the seat of our pants. And you know what's interesting too is um, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna name drop him or anything, but a uh, a League of Legends team coach for one of the Chinese teams was talking to me on Twitter and he was asking me like what like what's going like counter strike i feel like is so simple like there's not all these champions like and it's so basic to watch shouldn't everything just be figured out and i was just like man like i don't, I don't such know such a naive it. thing to say isn't it? it's so naive it's so <laughs> but like but it, it really it's is just like away, i know yeah like it really is just ignorance just somebody who isn't who doesn't watch it's like and that this is what i was i talked about i've talked about this on my stream before where it's like the reason why counter strike is so great is because the base concept is so simple and anybody yes. can watch it Anybody can watch it. My mom can watch it. My mom, like, you know what I mean? Like, my mom watched yeah, it. Yeah. Like, and literally anybody can watch it. And you can understand, basically, like, oh, I shot him. They died. That's good, right? And that, that basic, it's kind of like watching Rocket League. And everybody can watch it because you understand what's going on. But the actual, but the, but the actual, the, the depth of the game at a, at a, when you get to a tactical level is ridiculous. So it's the fact limitless, that- Limitless, right? Limit, exactly, it's limitless. So the fact that anybody can watch it, but the skill gap is actually limitless based on like, if, if you were, like, you could never perfect it. So like, w that's how, so that's what makes Counter-Strike such a long lasting successful esport is that the, the viewership can always be there because you can have casuals, you can have hardcore fans, you can have, you know, you have the whole spectrum of people who can watch it but the very, 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 very few people that can actually play it at the highest level. And that's what makes it so great. Because I'll tie this back in, actually. Basically, if I had to give more specifics of like examples where teams probably generally should do this a lot, 
Obvious examples to me would be the sites that are the, the hardest to retake. Yep. There, should, there should be the maps instantly that that jumps up on. And the other factor, again, if we're going to go personnel, that's a pretty good variable to use. It's a bit like the classic one where I prefer to put really strong aimers who are aggressive players in like almost hard entry roles because my logic always goes. Like if that guy's main strength is that he's really skilled and he's not afraid to go in, but he's not a super smart guy, Config's the most classic example. Just take the just take the decisions out of his hands. Don't put him in late game scenarios where he's going to play a one v three. So like that ain't his bag. So in the same yep. sense for retake scenarios, if you are a team that has more loose players, and especially players that don't have amazing comms like we're talking about here, and you're not the guys who are going to operate an amazing retake where you're able to like flush them out and position correctly and. Come, then just take that equation off the hands. Just just hold the site. Just just take that gunfight. Set it up so it's comfortable for you, and and try and go one for one. Well, and what's interesting too, I remember um, when I was playing with um, Grim, who now uh, signed with Team Liquid. When I was playing with him on Space Station, I realized he was making a lot of bad choices when it came to retakes. And this is kind of it's, this is all going to like go full circle and tie in. Is that there, he would retake sometimes when he shouldn't. He wouldn't retake when he should. So I just I gave him like this general rule: just go. Just go for it, no matter what. No matter what, just go for it. It's like, always go for the trade. Always go for the retake. Always just run in. Because he was always playing the like rotator spots like Connector on Mirage, right? So like the A smokes come in. There's a guy in the A site, and he's standing behind the smoke, spraying through the smokes and shit. And then you know we'd all wait, and it'd be like, dude, he was still alive. Just go. Literally just go. Just go in. And so I, so that, that was like sort of his general rule. And what happened is, over like the months and months, is he actually started to learn which ones were good and which ones were bad from, from experience. From experiencing it, like, oh, I ran through this smoke at this time, and they were all sitting there waiting. So it was a bad time to do that like you know i need to time it better and he actually yes. learned timings significantly better and now that's actually something when i watch his games i think that's something that he's really strong at it's something it's like one of his biggest strengths right now is his actual timings on those ct side peaks and um i, I think that you have to put players in those situations to learn that even if it's going to like lose you games early on when yes. it's a young player like that, it's actually worth it to let, give them that learning experience so that they can develop their game and actually like evolve and become better players. Unfortunately, though, that is the key part that is always going to put a lot of people, especially casual players who are thinking, I'm not in a team, like, do I need to know this? Yeah. The problem is when you tell them that detail, which unfortunately is just a function of learning, which is that when you try to sort of like rehaul your way of thinking, you're actually going to get worse in the short term. It reminds yeah. me of some like classic advice where I remember Steele, when he was early on doing YouTube stuff, did a video where he basically just explained the principle that actually, if you're basically not at the pro level, what you should be doing in all your matchmaking games it's just f figuring out literally the most boring but fundamentally correct positions, playing them over and over again, even if they know you're going to be there, just to learn, like you're saying here, all the possible permutations, like basically limit test of like, when does it work? When does it really not work? Because the problem is in the short term, like I was alluding to earlier, you're going to have the opposite feel, which is you're going to think like when you watch a pro match, obviously they'll use like one off angle, just one round only. And it was set up the whole time to get them like one kill there to, to get you back into a game but the problem is if you're a matchmaking scrub like you don't know why they did that so actually throwing yep. those what like the the rounds you gain from throwing in essentially a random setup are just gonna fuck you long term when you don't understand now well why isn't the one that should make sense why is that not working these last three rounds or is it not working like i was my read right but i didn't execute like you're not gonna you're gonna be lost completely it's actually better like you're saying to sort of build up a, an understanding of what happens in all the situations and then from that you can make your decisions yeah, the worst is when you're playing against a fucking MDL team and they're just running Astralis executes on you over and over again. It literally happened in a, like, because I, I stream with Mythic now, so I play like the Mythic games for fun. And we were playing against this team and they ran this like Astralis execute and, 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 and they kept running it over and over and over and over again. I was like, guys, you don't even understand like why the, like, you don't, you just don't understand any of this. You don't understand what the counters are. So at one point, I just I just ran through I just ran through the smoke and just like killed three of them. And I was like, this is this is the I'm like now I'm teaching you this is the counter to the strat that you were just ignoring the entire time because you didn't understand why the strat was made. You didn't understand the negatives of the strat and you didn't understand what the counters were to the strat. So like in, in order to like you can't just copy the best team in the world and just run their strats and just be like, oh, we're Astralis now. Like we like you were talking about earlier, you can't do that. It doesn't work. You actually have to like develop things on your own and learn things things on your own by experiencing them. I could also even tie in actually to what you were talking about with that League of Legends guy earlier. I even know who you're referring to, but like because he okay. also sent me a similar message. Oh, so okay. I yeah. actually know for that one who you're referring to, which makes perfect sense. 
Well, the funny thing about the, that guy's question is that's because, remember, because he comes from League of Legends, he's in the opposite ecosystem to us, right? Which is in League of Legends, because Riot themselves are literally changing the champions all the time, which is the equivalent mm. of if all the gun variables in the game just changed every three months. Yeah, and then simultaneously, they're obviously changing like how the game's played based on the objectives in League of Legends. Like at the moment, for example, you fight for all the dragons or whatever, whereas like back in the day, you, you know, you could like just split push or whatever the fuck you could. There's a million other ways of playing the game, yeah. but now it's like fairly streamlined. So the problem he has that he's misunderstanding is because essentially the developer, Riot, just decides how the game's going to be played. Not entirely, but they sort of do. By the yeah, sometimes level. unintentionally. Yeah, exactly. But but they effectively do, whether yeah. directly or indirectly. Yeah. Then the game just becomes, right, in this set period, it can be three months, six months, it can be a specific tournament. Everyone's just scrambling, right, what is the best approach that anyone's found? What he's missing is, in an open system like we have, where they very rarely change the variables, there's still massive turnover of what's working in the meta game but it's all based on things like what the other person is doing how they see the game what concepts they've built up what someone's tried so it's like it's not it's not going to be as obvious what you're going to change like it's like it makes perfect sense it might sound when i mentioned earlier that people like sk and fanatic like couldn't get up to date with the next meta like i'm criticizing them i'm not their problem is they were like tr victims of their own success because what they were doing was once the most cutting edge shit, and it was the other way around. If someone else wasn't doing what they were doing, they just didn't understand what Fnatic did, for example. The problem is, it's really hard to figure out without like the game telling you, like, I'm going to shift how I'm played now. It's hard to know when sort of you're now the one who's doing the old school shit that's not that effective now, and the other guys do. I mean, the most obvious example probably in CSGO history is Get Right probably did play like two years too long, trying to be like the most hardcore lurker in the history of the fucking game. Like he took the principle that he was the best at it and thought he could actually do it every round. Even when, you know, even his opponents were sort of saying like, well, you know, if it's Get Right to last alive, I'm going to assume he's just lurking on the other side of the map. Like it just became too obvious. But to him, he still thought it's about like execution and how I do it though. And it's like, he didn't realize like that, that what, what was, like, he would have been right the first few months, but years later, eventually you have to like update your thinking. Basically, it's almost like getting a new operating system or something at that point in time. You just got to level it up. And the and the reason why it's cool though is, I'm I'm not saying that like it's a negative. I actually think it's good because it means we define how the game's played. It's not like Val like it's not like Valve just comes along and says actually these executes are way too boring. I'm just going to halve the round time for no reason. Like. They don't do shit like that. Actually, we to some degree get to decide where this game goes based on our own ingenuity. Yeah, they, they, I remember they made the, the changes to the round time once and people were up in arms for quite a of bit. Course, now everybody's yeah. used to it. But yeah, Counter-Strike players don't like when Val fucks with our game. We're just like, <laughs> you, you, you stay away. Like, because you do dumb things like, like the Krieg. That, that was too dumb for too long. You know, you, you, you can't be trusted. You can't be trusted to make these changes to our competitive metagame because, you know, they just make terrible choices consistently. But yeah, going going full circle. Ironically, well, I guess not that, that ironic, but with uh, with the with, with the get right thing is like he did the same thing where he said he, you know did the same thing for too long, and strangely enough, even though he's right in the sense that if I execute this perfectly, it will work, right? Like that that's technically correct, yeah. but oh. but you're but you're not playing the odds because right now in this current meta, the odds of you winning a round doing this versus doing something else is less. So even if you execute it perfectly, you're going to win the round. Or, or you're going to execute perfectly and you're going to play well, the chances of you executing it perfectly based on the other what the other team is doing is low. So that's why you should be doing something else, which you know ties back in to the original macro concept we were talking about is just, you know, th there's depending on the meta, what's going on right now, depending on the teams you're playing against, the same thing isn't always correct. And so you have to play the odds for every individual situation. One, one last thing I'll say, just to tie it up mm -hmm. on my end, is this is also one of the reasons, in my opinion, why I don't worry that much about that whole angle of like, oh, but look, why have we got the same old IGLs from 10, 15? It's like, because their experience is fucking the most OP thing in this entire game, guys. Like, the problem is, I, I always said it this way, right? Even if, even if you, we're starting a draft, right, and you take simple... All right, cool. I'll just take Nico. Like, have I really lost that much? Like, that's a, that's a, like a fucking one A one B discussion, right? Like, we've yep. both got unbelievably good players, and it isn't actually going to be those players that decide if our team's a champion. It's like, who else are we going to pick? The problem is when we start going to like IGLs. There, I know, I know the superstars are amazing, but there are way less IGLs that are amazing relative to the other IGLs. And so the problem I always have is. 
and your region, especially in NA, there are a lot of people don't seem to value the IGL. I mean, I've just seen Daps get essentially slow kicked out of another fucking millionth team that he built. He put all the stuff in and then they just thought, what if the guy doing his job could just shoot the Deagle better? Like, I think I've seen this fucking movie play out before. So like, the problem is a lot of this thinking right now will only come from super inexperienced IGLs, in my opinion. It's also because, logically, they should be the next coaches. They just haven't really transitioned that role. So, like, if people wonder again why this stuff never comes up, it's because it's only going to be people like us who like to nerd out for fun about it. Or it's going to be people who, by the way, the reason they don't tell you this shit is because right now it's one of their trade secrets. It's like some shit that they know that True. they're not going to they're not going to tell their rivals that stuff. They're going to let them just keep making the same mistake. It's like that comment I always say about, you know, whenever I give the really macro example of I personally think Team Liquid always played too slow against Astralis mm -hmm. because the logic is they just played into Astralis's hands. My joke with that is, why the fuck would Astralis ever tell you that's what they're doing? No, they do the opposite. Because what would be great is Astralis would always say, right, when they would beat Team Liquid every time, like oh such a hard game great game guys you really push it's like that's exactly what I'd say if I always had like the fucking stylistic edge on I'm never going to give him a hint as to like by the way uh, if you just changed this up it'd be really hard for me why the fuck would you of course you wouldn't Yep, it's like it's like uh, I don't know if you saw a couple days ago Yanko said on his stream oh TSM just shit on us in scrims TSM just absolutely shit on us in scrims today wow they're looking really good I'm sitting there thinking I don't know, Yankos. I don't know. That's set uh, him up. yeah. That might be a little bit <laughs> just set, just buttering them up, just to get sure. like just building everyone's expectations, putting even more pressure on them, taking some pressure off of G two. You know sure. what I mean? Like I was like, these are. I, I don't. I don't know Yankos personally or anything like that. But to me, that seemed like some, Could be some, mind some big brain sure. mind games going yeah. on there. Could be. Yeah, because I, I don't know how it works in the League of Legends community, but in the Counter Strike community, you're not really supposed to talk about your scrim, or you, no, you no. can talk about you can talk about your scrims, but you don't really talk about like the team you played against. Like like yes. you don't say you don't say, oh yeah, this team was uh, doing this in scrims yesterday. It was really good. Like you just kind of don't. It's just kind of BM. Like you just don't really do that. But I, I know in League of Legends, Valens was telling me a couple of months ago that like teams all record their scrims and vods and send them to each other. I was like, what the fuck? No way! That seems crazy to me. Like, how, how, why do they do that? That that's what that's what. Wait a minute! Me. Wait a minute! Is that now you've just made the penny drop for you? Might have just let it go there, Davy, because this is what logical. Well, remember, this must be what prompted him to do what seemed in isolation like the stupidest tweet ever, where he basically just said like. Why don't we all just let everyone record the scrim demos in CS? You know what he basically Yeah, that's that. what I'm talking obviously about. Obviously, I yeah. was like memeing on because I was like, what? Well, at that point, Valens, why don't you have a meme you the straps or something? What the fuck? You know, <laughs> yeah. like, don't you want to do your job? Actually, that makes more sense now if he was, if basically he got involved in the League of Legends side and just knew that's what they do there by default, right? Yeah. That makes sense now. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Not as stupid that. as I thought then. <laughs> Yeah, no, because apparently that is what they do in League of Legends. So right. I was like, Counter Strike teams should do that too. It, it would, it would like raise the level of game. And I was like, I don't know if it would. It would definitely make things fucking unique. I guess. Like, sure. uh, I can't even imagine like just sending your scrim vods to teams you're gonna play against. Although, like, it makes sense if you're scrimming against a team you're never gonna compete against. Like hypothetically, if there's like a flashpoint, like if there's teams that are exclusive to flashpoint and teams that are exclusive to ESL, sure. those teams could could scrim each other and share vods right and then you wouldn't really have to worry about it until the majors came around i guess but overall i don't think that's a very no applicable concept for counter-strike in my opinion but um i've obviously been wrong once or twice so who knows this video was kindly supported by Dean Tanglis, Pronogo, Alexander Rao, Andreas Crockneys, Eric Hillestad, Hades, J Dubs, the Puyallup tribe, Tobias Bernasconi, Vatrisam, Zinged, James Peterson, and as always, a special thanks goes out to my boy Jerky's Minion. Would you like to suggest a topic or a guest for my content? Do you want to ask a question in my monthly video AMA? Do you want teasers to see who the upcoming guests are going to be? Maybe you'd like to take part in one of those monthly donated discussions with me about esports. Well, put your money where your mouth is and join the Screw Illuminati today in the Patreon link in the description box below.